Hey everybody, I'm Jimmy. I am an alcoholic. Let's give Jason a hand. Jason, you know, he has, a, he has an absolute gift. He has a gift. He can turn this huge event and somehow just make it all about him. He just, he can do that like nobody else. Who else is having a good time here this weekend besides me? Yeah! Look at that! Hey, anybody care that we don't have badges? No, nobody cares! No, nobody cares. We're having fun. Yeah, I've had a fantastic time. First of all, I will tell you that I flew last weekend. I was in uh, Bali, Indonesia. I took a 20, took a four hour flight to Thailand, then a 22 hour flight back to Los Angeles so that I could talk on Tuesday. I drove from Malibu, California to Acton, California, a little H&I thing up there, Acton. It's kind of a men's sort of deal. I go to talk at the a and and I came here. I said, Jason, I'm coming. I tell you that, and next, next uh, Thursday, I'm going from Malibu, California on a Thursday, which is the new Friday in Los Angeles. Thursday, <laughs> I'm driving to Laguna Niguel, California. That's going to be three and a half hours. I tell you folks that right up front, right at the beginning, to let you know I'm willing to go to any length to listen to myself. Uninter <laughs> uninterrupted for 45 minutes. And I'll tell you right now, as much as I've enjoyed the great Mike did a fantastic job, and the beautiful, lovely, and talented Katie, and Johnny E over there killed it. We've had great speakers as much, and I've met so many great people. As much as I enjoyed that, I'll tell you right now, this is my favorite part of any meeting <laughs> or any convention. Oh yeah, this is, this is it, Jason. You know, because I always get something out of it. I'll be the last one in here talking, and I tell you, I still drive home feeling better. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, my home group's an hour discussion meeting. I sit there 55 minutes, I have no idea what anybody's saying. I'm just waiting for my five minutes because uh, I always seem to get a little something out of it, Jason. First thing I should tell you before all that, number one, I didn't always look like a cop. Uh, this was a very punk rock haircut when I got it. When I had hair, it was punk. It was, you know, most of you guys, I got this haircut in 1979, and I know half this room had mullets in 1979. But I was a rebel. I had a short do on the side, and spiked up on the top, and uh, God, I, that was like 18, 19, 20 years old when I got it. By the time I was 30, I looked like a cop everywhere I went. I could see the look in people's eyes. They're like, you know, here he comes because a cop. No, and... Uh, God, I was in Mexico at a convention one time in Mexico, and a lady, I was sitting at the front getting ready to talk, and a lady walked up to me and said, are you a state trooper? Yeah, it's just, it was unbelievable. Now I'm 63 years old, I sort of morphed into a military. People think I'm, I just came through TSA, I look like a military guy. The TSA guy says, what are you, a retired military? I look like a bit of military. I've never been in the military. I mean, i never been in the military. I did a short tour in the Salvation Army, but, uh, <laughs> I don't get any credit for that. No stolen valor from me. Uh, where were we, Jason? All right. Hey, I'm having a great weekend. I really have. Re you know, what a great committee. Thank you so much. Doing a great job, Randy. It's a fantastic event. Nobody cares about the little stuff. Everybody cares about the big stuff. A lot of love going on in here. People suiting up and showing up and celebrating what we got here. And uh, man, I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't give up my seat in AA for anyone or anything because I don't have what it takes. I do not have what it takes to have lived the life I've lived. I know where I got the power. I got the power from rooms like this and people like you. And uh, I will tell you right now, uh, unlike every other male speaker you hear, you know, they're always, you know, good family and world-class athletes. When they were in high school, they were athletes or artists. I'm from West Los Angeles now, and there's, you know, a lot of artists over there, guitar players, academics, and you know, we hear how, you know, all the, the, the drinking accelerated in college. And then all this potential, you know, we see how, we hear how it goes, you know, the potential goes away. All that potential they had is gone from alcoholism and drug addiction. But I'll tell you right now, that's not my story. 
My story is for all those who show no promise in anything. <laughs> it's true, I'm tall, but I can't jump. Uh, you can already tell I'm not real smart. I'm not an academic. I wanted to be a rock star, but I look like a cop. Uh, I can't play the guitar, don't sing, don't write music. Uh, I don't know how to fish. You know, I can't fix nothing. I showed no promise in anything but like burglary. And uh, <laughs> so I started at the bottom, even in, in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I will tell you that I, I'm not really originally from Malibu, California. I don't know if you can tell I'm from Delaware County in Pennsylvania. I got sent to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1975. December of 1975 by the juvenile court in the state of Pennsylvania. I'd been arrested, I was 16, I'd been arrested 11 times for, you know, not real criminal stuff, like you know, some of you guys I'm looking at out there. I wasn't a real criminal, but uh, <laughs> kid stuff. I'd been arrested 11 times. Typical kid stuff, possession and consumption of alcohol by a minor, disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, urinating in public, you know, all the classy things. One of those urinating in public, I didn't even bother getting my fly down, man. I was just uh, <laughs> wasted here, man. T too much work. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye. Um, <laughs> Hey, I'm lucky, you know, we've heard about it already this weekend. One of the other per people mentioned life is about seconds and inches. And I'm lucky I never had to register as a sex offender because, uh, you know, cops, some of you guys know this, cops don't want to get you for urinating in public. The cops always wanted to get me for indecent exposure. Luckily, I've got insufficient evidence. So, uh, <clears throat> hey, it's not all bad. I'm grateful for the little things, right? Right, Jason? It's not so bad, Jason. He'll tell you. He's got so many nicknames, but the first one I ever heard was they called him Stubby Jason. They're leaving. They're leaving in the back, Jason. Uh, I'm from a broken alcoholic home like many of you, and uh, you know, I, I, something was wrong with me. I come from uh, bad alcoholic stock. I come from a family of my father. They were kind of alcoholic that, uh, you know, bad stuff happened in my family, in my life, in my little world, and uh, my father left, and, uh, and I seen things kids shouldn't see, and I've heard stuff kids shouldn't hear, and my father abandoned the family, and my mother, was, uh, had to go to work. She never worked a day in her life. She had to go to work. And uh, my father never came back. She never found him. Her, his family hid him. And, uh, and there was something wrong with me. I just was out of control. I was unsupervised. My mom had to go to work. And listen, I just didn't like school. I can't be the only guy here. I didn't like school, right? I mean, I like to go to the school, you know, in the morning, because that's where the action was. And, uh, yeah, I'd go up to school in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, I'd be at the, in the parking lot right in front of the cafeteria where everybody goes in, and I'd say, I started bumming money when I was a kid. You know, I stumbled into uh, drinking, and I don't know if you can tell or not, I'm a glue sniffer and a PCP smoker, and I, I, uh, I had that PCP glare when I got to, when I got to AA, you know. <laughs> Whoa! And uh, anyway, when I just dis I've discovered... You know, drinking, like I said, I wasn't an athlete. I had a chip on my shoulder. I was misbehaved. And uh, I just bought money from girls in the parking lot at 8 o'clock in the morning. Started in junior high school. Hey, got a nickel, got a dime, got a quarter. I'd bum, you know, 15, 20 minutes. I'd bum $2.50. This is the early 70s. And I'd leave campus, you know, with a buddy, or two, a buddy or two. Other, you know, I was a truant long before I ever, you know, was a... Uh, had an alcohol and drug problem, but uh, anyway, I'd leave, leave the campus with a couple of friends, sometimes a girl goes sit behind the liquor store and I'd have a guy get us a run. I'd see the same guys every day. Hey man, 
here's two dollars. Could you get us a run? I got a girl. We're having a party. I do the same guys every morning. I give a guy two dollars. I'd say keep the change because back then for a dollar eighty, I could get a bottle of banana red MD 2020. <laughs> you guys know what that is? In seaside Oregon, you got MD 2020. All right. All right, those of you who don't know, MD-2020, it's actually a Schedule I hallucinogen. That, <laughs> hey, somehow this stuff made it to the wine section of liquor stores back in the day. It made no sense. Wine, it's never seen a grape. It was, a, you know, fortified wine. Let me tell you, it was like rocket fuel. Uh, MD-2020 is like having meth in the energy drink section because... Uh, <laughs> I was on the MD 2020 diet, lose three days in one week. <laughs> and uh, MD 2020 take you downtown fast. And uh, man, I got in trouble. I've been arrested in the snow with no shirt on 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, so I had to take it easy. You know, sometimes I, I had to get, I, I, sometimes I take it a little easier. $2 and 20 cents, I get a six pack of 16 ounce Colt 45. And uh, yeah, everything I drank had a number, Bacardi 151, Old English 800. That's how I learned math. And um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that doesn't make me a big drinker. You know, I've been sitting in these AA meetings. I, I've heard guys say, yeah, I drank for 40 years, five gallons of whiskey every day for 40 years, didn't work, didn't sleep, didn't eat, just drank. And uh, I, yeah, okay, but I'll say this, when you're you know, 14 years old, you've been sniffing glue, smoking angel dust, and hey, a six pack of 16 ounce cold 45 at nine in the morning, get your ride home in the back of the police car. Take care, have a great Saturday, man, all right. Uh, <laughs> I'm used to that. So, um, <laughs> but my real thing was keg parties. Keg parties, right? Come on. This is a keg party crowd, right? Hell yeah. That's my thing because number one, I never had any money. So, uh, you know, you hear about somebody's keg party, so and so's house in the neighborhood, eight o'clock Friday night. Man, I'd be there at 6 15 with a pitcher. You know, ready to go, man. Get my drink on. And uh, boy, I'm the first one in the party. I go right straight to the keg. They tap that keg and man, I'm drinking like somebody's gonna steal it from me. And I'm, you know, I'm filling them up. I know all the tricks. You open your throat, I'm throwing them down. And it happened over and over and over. It's a, you know, catastrophe for drinkers like me at a keg party because within 30 minutes, 20 minutes, older guys, bigger guys, would uh, say, you know, dude, you gotta step away from the keg. There's 50 people in line. You're sitting there drinking five drinks for everybody else's, you know, and, and they'd shove me away. And uh, I had to resort to drink stealing. I'm a drink stealer. Any other drink stealers out here in Seaside, Oregon? All right, you, you didn't even have to raise your hand. Take one look at you, man, <laughs> Jesus. He's probably stealing pastries this morning outside. <laughs> yeah, because some people, some people drink like this at parties. There's cans and cups and bottles around. You know, there's people that drink like this. And they set it down. Can you imagine with a ninja like me? I got all the tricks. Hey, hey, look who it is. Because I can't see. You know, I can't see. If I can, I drink till I'm cross-eyed and I can't see. My thing is, if I can still get up, I can stand up, I'm not that drunk. But I can't see and there's cans and cups and bottles everywhere and some of you know, you know, I'm grabbing everything I can find and open my throat and just throw them down. Mmm. Oh, every third, fourth one, cigarette butts, right? <laughs> hey, man. They came out with them brown bottles. That's the risk you had to take. And, uh, and let me tell you, people hate drink stealers. They hate them, hate them. I've been caught. I've been beat up so many times by little dudes and chicks. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they hate drink stealers. 
and a typical night for me. I wish it. I wish it happened, you know, once, and I learned from it. But it didn't. Bless you. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't stick. But it happened over and over. I'd be at the party, and I'm having fun, and I'm laughing. And the next thing I know, I wasn't just a blackout drinker. I'm graying out. I was here, and then I was there. And how did I get here? And now I'm outside the party, and I'm bleeding. I'm bleeding from the head, and I don't know what happened. And they've locked me out. And the party, they're saying, you're not coming. I said, you're not coming in. You're going to get your ass. You know, they're threatening me. And I thought, I didn't even know what I did. And it happened over and over, this kind of thing. And I'd walk home. I'm from Pennsylvania in the winter. I know this, it gets cold here in Oregon. I don't know if it gets Pennsylvania cold. Some of you folks ever drank in the real cold and the snow and all that? There was a guy here from Alaska and North Dakota. Jesus, that's even colder. So uh, anyway, I'd stumble home in the frozen ice. I remember walking and stumbling home over and over. And uh, I'm locked out of the house because I snuck out, wasn't supposed to be out. And I'm scared to wake up my mom. So I sleep on, I sleep in her car. I sleep in her car and I come to in the morning. I wish I could tell you this only happened once. But I come to in the morning and my whole crotch from my navel to my knees, all through my inner thighs, burning, red, raw, inflamed, skin gone, red. Like, oh no, it was so painful. I'd say, oh my God. Who was I with? A stray dog? I mean, what happened to me? <laughs> what has happened to me? My skin is gone. It hurts. And then I would see my pants, and they'd have an outline, and I'd smell them, and I'd go, oh, I did it again. I walked home with frozen piss pants. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, chicks don't dig that, Randy. That is not, not a good look. <laughs> you know, it's funny now, but when you're 15, you've had so much trauma and so much shame. I know what it's like when the neighborhood looks down on you. Everybody, old adults, parents, other kids, decent girls looking down. I'd walk down the street and the two girls... Lisa and Nancy Pavinsky, they'd see me coming with my PCP glare. They'd see me coming, and they'd run across the street. And I know what that feels like. And, uh, you know, I know, what it's, I know what it feels like when your friends say, dude, everyone saw you. Everyone saw you at that party. You were trying to talk to girls, and your pants were pissed. And... Uh, <laughs> Pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization ran through my DNA. It didn't take too long at all. If I had any courage, I'd have taken myself out. I was messed up, messed up. Something was wrong, immature, insecure, overly emotional. God, I thought of something the other day, yesterday, I guess it was. Somebody said something. I, n I never share this from a podium because it's dark and it's rotten. But you know what? It turned around. You know, when I was young and I got sent to AA, and I, I, I guess when I, I had a few weeks or months still having ugly dysfunction at home, my mom said, those, those AAs can't help you. You're too sick. And, uh, you know, I never forgot it. But I also, she got to live to see that she was wrong. She was wrong. And uh, anyway, uh, I don't know how I got there, but let's see. Uh, so, yeah, okay. So here's the good part. I get, first of all, I'm living, by now I'm out of school uh, because I don't go to school and I get, I'm living in a boy's home. I'm living in a boy's home. The coot's home for wayward boys. And, uh, and I'm in there and I, you know, I'm not a tough guy or anything. I was as tall as I am now, but I weighed about 50 pounds less, six foot three, 160. And uh, not a real threat, let's put it that way. So, uh, so I'm in there with developmentally challenged kids and orphans and incest survivors, and then me, a big dumb loser that wouldn't go to school, wouldn't listen to his mom, immature, insecure, overly emotional, overly sensitive, troubled. And uh, I got sent to AA. First, I got sent to the Scared Straight program. I got sent to Scared Straight. I couldn't believe it. I thought, for, I couldn't believe it 20 years later it was on TV. I couldn't believe it. I thought, wait, I thought it was only in this little town. It was at the Delaware County uh, Medium Security Correctional Facility. They sent me and another kid in there. And man, the 
inmates were screaming at me. And I will tell you right now, your speaker this morning does not respond well to tough love. I don't like it, man. Katie knows, right? That guy, Gary, Barry, Barry Woodstock, threatening me. Anyway, so the, I get sent, I, I'm, I'm at the Scared Straight program. That doesn't work because I just uh, shut down people screaming at me. But I got sent to AA. In December of 1975, I had to go to 16 meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. There was a judge that was sending kids. I was the first one of about 10 kids in my neighborhood that got sent to AA during the course of a, you know, a six months or a year of getting in trouble. These, all these kids were getting sent. I was the first one. And I'll tell you what I found in Alcoholics Anonymous the first time I went. And I knew, just like uh, John talked about last night, I'd been to every psychologist and psychiatrist and social worker around town, but I got to AA and I felt something different. Because let me tell you, those old people in AA were kind to me. They were kind to me. They were, no one ever said I was too young. They didn't call me a drug addict. They were kind. They gave me rides. They say, I'm picking you up. They say, kid, I'm picking you up tomorrow morning, tomorrow night for the meeting right here at 730. I'm going to pick you up at 730. And they said, when an AA guy tells you he's going to pick you up at 730, he's there at 730. And uh, I understood it, even with my uh, brain damage. I just sort of, I didn't know the word was integrity, but I knew that there was something good going on. Those guys were kind. They gave me rides. They gave me cigarettes, two and three cigarettes for the road. You know, back when cigarettes were 35 cents a pack. <laughs> I know newcomers today are on their own. Nobody, $12 a pack, nobody giving newcomers cigarettes. <laughs> you know, yeah, roll your own, man. That's a, that's a, but I got lucky, I guess. And uh, man, they, after the meeting, when they realized I, you know, I wasn't as dangerous as I looked, they'd take me out to the uh, Howard Johnson's or some coffee shop after a meeting and buy me pie. And I thought, man, this ain't so bad. I had no plans to stop drinking. I, you know, that's the only thing I had, the only thing I ever was any good at. But. Uh, I, I knew the guys in AA were kind. In fact, those guys in AA said, first of all, nobody can tell me different. Kindness is the language of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was going on in 1975, and it was going on, I assume, in 1935, 36, 37. Those guys getting some meetings started, they were being kind to one another and welcoming each other. And let me tell you, I see it going on right here in Seaside, Oregon in 2023. Man, a lot of joy, a lot of kindness. We, we got plenty to cheer about. We got plenty to cheer about. If your life is anything like mine today, and I have a lot of distance between the ugliness of alcohol. You know, I laugh a lot about my little bit of drink, and I laugh a lot about it. But I'll tell you, I never forget, when alcoholism is on, it's ugly, man. It's ugly. You know, drinking is funny stories, but alcoholism is ugly. You know, full of traumatized children, domestic violence, cops, court cases, hideous, unspeakable loneliness, despair, isolation. That's what alcoholism is. That's not a cold beer at the beach. That's alcoholism. And I never forget. And if your life is like mine today, I got distance. My life hasn't been like that in a long time. We got plenty to cheer about. You'll never hear me whining about my problems in the AA meetings because I, when I get five minutes or 45 minutes, I talk about, take care, Mike. Good seeing you. All right. So uh, uh, I talk about the good stuff. All right. Shorty Mike, is that where he's going? To the bathroom? There he is. Okay. That, at your age, nobody cares, Mike. Okay. Uh, Jason, this is it for you, Jason. Never again. Hey, did I give a special welcome to the VIPs up there in the, in the VIP section? Way to go, people. Let's give them a hand. Where was I? Oh, so the old AA guy said to me, kid, you are lucky to know about this AA. These old guys would say, kid, you are lucky to know about this AA at your age. Look at you, man. I wish I'd have known, these old guys say, I wish I'd have known about AA when I was your age. I could have saved myself a lot of trouble. They said it over and over. Guys said it, girls said it. They said it before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting. They said, 
my life would have went different if I knew about AA. I was qualified at 15, these guys would say. And uh, boy, my life would have been different. I wouldn't have lost my family, wouldn't have gone to prison. And uh, they said, kid, you stick around this AA, you can't imagine how good your life will be. You can't imagine how good your life will be, kid, if you stick around this AA. And I remember exactly what I felt and what I thought when they said that. I thought, mister, you don't even know me, man. You don't know me. I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I had the opposite of the Midas touch, and I knew it. Everything I touched turned to crap. Bad stuff happened to me. I felt like a jinx. People said things to me that were implied that I was some kind of jinx. My best friend was a, was a good, good kid from a good family. I had you know, both parents in the house, a beautiful sister, and he was a handsome, blonde-haired, Nordic Eric Hagman, and he was just a drinker, just a drinker. But of course, a dumb druggie like me, I turned him on to that angel dust smoking that PCP. He went and walked in front of the Metro liner. I was 15, he was 16 years old, gone. And uh, I knew that I wasn't gonna be, I couldn't be like those AA guys that were kind and loving, talked about God and unselfish, sharers. You know, I don't share. I got to AA. The first thing I ever heard in AA I could relate to was they said it's a selfish program. I thought, damn, I'm qualified. I can. <laughs> then I heard people say, I'm a people pleaser. I heard them say, hey, I'm a people pleaser. And I thought, wait a second, you're a people pleaser? Am I in the wrong room? I've been a people displeaser my whole life. Just upsetting people everywhere I go. And uh, anyway, you know what? Now I know when an old guy, those old AA guys in their 30s or 40s, whatever it was, uh, when an AA guy tells you, stick around here, you can't imagine how good your life will be. They know what they're talking about. It's like they were looking in a crystal ball. It's like they were looking in a crystal ball. They knew the truth. I was the first one of all my little dumb friends, six of me and five other guys were sent to AA in the same year. That, you know, my good friends. And uh, none of my other friends lived to be 30 years old. I was three weeks clean and sober. My, uh, first of all, my one friend walked in front of the uh, Metro liner. My next door neighbor, I was three weeks clean and sober, going to AA on my own, no court card, done and uh, going on my own. My next door neighbor, 18, died of a heroin overdose. Two of my friends, Barry Barlow and Ronnie Willerton, crashed cars going 100 miles an hour on the same street, 30 mile an hour, on, in a 30 mile zone, in the same year of each other. My friends, there were no happy endings, and uh, I stuck around AA. I stuck around AA. My sobriety date is May 10, 1977, and just like, if I can white knuckle, if I hold on 25 more days, I'll celebrate 46 years clean and sober. Just like my legendary member friend over there got sober at age 17 and I've never had a legal drink. And let me tell you, I don't have what it takes. You can already tell I'm not smart. I'm not smart. I'm not, no one's ever accused me of being emotionally well adjusted. And, uh, I'm troubled, I need, I need treatment, and, uh, but I found power. I found power in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been supported, I've been loved. I don't know how I got so lucky. I don't know what I did right. I don't know what I did right, but I know this. I knew I could not, I knew I was alcoholic. I could not, I could not drink safely. And uh, boy, you know, I got, I got, I got a story that uh, so I don't know. Somebody was saying it, you know. And I, I know, and I learned these things in hindsight. You know, you hear them later. You don't hear them your first day in AA. But I remember hearing, you know, I, I built up this huge tolerance. You know, I used to be able to drink a ton, a ton, a ton of booze. And at the end, the last few months of my <coughs> drinking, you know, I a couple of beers, I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up and I couldn't get drunk. Was it Katie talking about? I could not get that sense of ease and comfort. It was over, it was over. And that was a terrifying place. And I'm not one of those guys that you hear. I already mentioned them. I drank 40 years, 
five gallons of whiskey every day for 40 years. And after 40 years, never working, never sleeping, never eating, just drinking, I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and the obsession to drink and use was lifted. You ever hear those guys? I'm thinking, really? And you're still coming here? What's the point? What do you, why? I didn't get it. Because I got sober the old fashioned way. Chain smoking, white knuckling it, sitting on my hands, looking at the clock, thinking, oh God, can I make it to the AA meeting? Please, God, I'm so uncomfortable in my own skin, my gut's churning. And, uh, but the one day at a time tool was a big, it was, it was uh, genius, genius, because I knew I could stay sober one day. And you know, I waited for those AA meetings because I got something out of those AA meetings that I just don't have on my own. I know what it is now, but I got to those AA meetings and I got some hope. I got some hope. And let me tell you, it's all these years later, and I will tell you right now, I still get something out of AA. I get something out of these meetings I just don't have on my own. This is where I get reminded who I really am and where I really come from and how much this plan for living has helped me because I'm not self-made. There's nothing about me that's self-made. I will tell you that I'm alive today because someone, in a just like many of you folks, someone in AA took interest in my case. I had a guy in the neighborhood, drove a gold Dodge Dart. He came into that with an easy does it bumper sticker. And uh, he came into that coots home. He was a retired guy and he uh, did nothing but H and I work. And he came into that coots home and I recognized him from my neighborhood. He was like six foot five in a gold Dodge Dart with an easy does it bumper sticker. And this guy pulled me out of scrapes. He used to, in fact, I was still drinking. I, I drank again after the, the coots home and I was out again. And he used to pull, I'd see his car so I'd hide around the corner, but he'd see me. And he'd pull up his car, pull off to the side of the road. He'd get out of his car, come over and talk to me. He'd say, Jimmy, Jimmy. And I, you know, I'm smelling like weed and I'm, you know, I'm full of shame. And uh, he walks up to me and says, Jimmy, hey, you know, we're saving you, a, we're saving you a seat at the meeting. You're gonna come back to the meetings and see us? And he, then he'd give me these big bear hugs, cheek to cheek. He'd put his cheek on me, <laughs> say, I love you. And I thought, Oh, this guy is so creepy, man. <laughs> Can I get a couple cigarettes? And, uh, and you know what? I got lucky because this guy didn't want nothing from me. This guy didn't want anything weird from me. And uh, he saved my life. How do you thank a guy for saving your, my life, man? How do you thank a guy? He pulled me out of scrapes, got me back into school because when I started coming back to AA, he was there for me and he walked me through and talked me through what we're doing in AA. And he, first of all, he did amazing things for me, things that no one else could do. He got me back into school. I got into a different school. I didn't do well, as you can tell. And uh, <laughs> he got me a job. I worked at Sears. Roebuck, $2.30 an hour, and that was a huge ego boost for a guy like me. Then he did the miraculous. I wasn't supposed to get a driver's license until I was 21 years old. I'd been in a, uh, I was innocent. I was in a stolen car. I didn't know it was stolen. And uh, <laughs> I was just a passenger. That's the story. I'm sticking to it. And uh, anyway, I wasn't supposed to get a driver's license. This guy got me a driver's license, wrote, you know, AA people know people, wrote something to the state. I got a driver's license. I used to drive his gold Dodge Dart, picking up derelicts on the street and taking them to meetings. And don't think when I was young thinking, hey, look at me, man, sober guy, picking up old guys and taking them to AA. I didn't think, hey, what a life. I thought, this sucks, man. But. Uh, <laughs> But I, you know what, I was so desperate to not be me and to have some kind of hope, have some kind of hope. And uh, I got some kind of courage. I got some kind of courage because I saved $600 and I'm 18 years old and I can't go to college. I can't, I'm done high school. I can't go to college because number one, my mom doesn't have any money and I'm a D minus student, you know, when I cheat. And, uh, <laughs> I can't go to the military. I can't go to the military on a technicality. I'm a coward. And uh, <laughs> what am I going to do? Well, I'll tell you what you do when you got, I, I just, I, you know, looking back, I realized that I got some kind of courage because I'd never been anywhere. I'd never been anywhere. I've been arrested 11 times. I could show you on a map. 
all within the same four square blocks of where I grew up. I'd never been anywhere. But as an AA member, I got some kind of courage. And I thought, maybe if I don't drink and I don't use, maybe they got AA in California. And, uh, and I will tell you, new people here, I know there's a few new people. We're going to do that countdown soon. We're going to see you new people. And I want to tell you that uh, if you want to try, you're new to this thing, and you want to try not drinking, you want to try going to AA and try this thing, you don't know it yet. You haven't met them yet. But all around the world, people are rooting for you, man. They're rooting for you. We, we want you to get some of this because it's the, it's, it's the greatest life. It, you can't get to where we come from and where we get to. And I better speed up. I will just tell you what happened in my life. I came to California with $600 and uh, I found other brothers and sisters on this path. And I don't have time to go talk about the book tonight. I might read something real quick, but I don't have time to get into the steps or God. I will tell you what I do always save time for, and that is to tell you that I, first of all, I can pray till I'm blue in the face. Sometimes, most of the time, I don't feel nothing. And I can read that book and read that book, and sometimes that book's not enough for this alcoholic. I can work those steps and write inventories. Some days it's not enough. For me, I, if I don't surround myself with other brothers and sisters on this path, I got nothing. My AA people, my higher power comes through you people. Because that's, I'll just tell you about power right now. All of you folks with your collective experience and your wisdom, you folks are a power great. You plus me is a power greater than just me. All of you plus me is a power greater than me. And guess what, new people? All of us, plus you, is a power greater than just you. There's power in these meetings. In fact, I'll read you the power thing. I got about 10 minutes, Jason, maybe. <laughs> what do I say, about 45 minutes? How long are we going, two o'clock? What's, what's the schedule? <laughs> How about this, anybody ever read that book? There's a blue book in AA? Anybody ever read it? There's a story in the back. Let me tell you about power. I'm not making it up. It's in the book. Guys tried everything, seeing a psychologist, psychiatrist, and a doctor. Doctor, I need help. And he's trying and trying and says, Doc, I lost the power to stop drinking. Well, Doc, this is, uh, this is me, an alcoholic. Well, Doc, what are we going to do? There's nothing I can do, he said, and nothing medicine can do. However, I've heard of an organization called Alcoholics Anonymous that has had some success with people like you. They make no guarantees and are not always successful. But if you want, to, you want to, you're free to try them. It might work. Many times in intervening years, I have thanked God for that man, a man who had the courage to admit failure, a man who had the humility to confess that all the hard-won learning of his profession could not turn up the answer. I looked up an AA meeting and I went there alone. Here I found an ingredient that had been lacking in any other effort I had made to save myself. Here was power. Here was power to live to the end of any given day. Power to have the courage to face the next day. Power to have friends. Power to help others. Power to be sane. Power to stay sober. That was seven years ago and many AA meetings ago, and I haven't had a drink in those seven years. Moreover, I am deeply convinced that so long as I continue to strive in my bumbling way towards the principles I first encountered in the earlier chapters of this book, this remarkable power will continue to flow through me. What is this power? With my AA friends, all I can say is a power greater than myself. Let me tell you what I think. Now we got opinion time. We read the book. Now it's opinion time. <laughs> the word powerless is in the book once. The word power is in the book 64 times. This guy talked about power. There's power in here. And the book is giving a report. The steps are giving a report on what, what, it, what we did, what they did. They admitted they were powerless over alcohol. The step doesn't say we admit we are powerless over alcohol. 
Step says we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. Guess what I think that means? I think that means that's before we got to AA. That's before I got with you people. Before I got with you people, I was powerless over my alcoholism and drug addiction. Now I'm in AA. I got power, man. This guy got it, and he got in the book. Uh, you know? So we got, well, there's power here, people. Power to stay sane, power to stay sober, power to help others. I don't have the power to have lived this life. I got it from rooms like this and people like you. I know I did. I know I did. I can I'm going to tell you real fast what happened with my dumb life. What does a guy do? What does a guy do with no skills? I came to California where, you know, granola country. Land of fruits, nuts, and flakes. I knew I'd fit right in. And uh, got there with $600, and I found my other brothers and sisters. I ended up over there at Ohio Street in West LA. It's a big AA meeting hall. 40 something years ago, there were 250 people there every, every, you know, four or five nights a week. And you know what? Back then, there were probably 40 of them. 40 of us were under age 30. So there was all these youngsters there all this fellowship, all this program. And uh, you go there tonight, tonight's a Saturday. Yeah, you go there tonight, 250 people. None of them are 25 years old. They're all youngsters. It's a little pocket of enthusiasm, youngsters staying sober. Well, because I found other brothers and sisters there. And you know what I did? I had fellowship. I'm gonna read something about the fellowship in a second too. But before I'll tell you, I'll tell you about the fellowship. Jason, go sit down over here, would you? <laughs> Who wants to read something about the fellowship? Yeah. You ever hear these people? The fellowship's not going to keep you sober. Oh, yeah, of course you got to do the work. Of course you got to do the work. Work's how you change. Works how you change, but don't put down the fellowship. Bill Wilson didn't put down the fellowship. Let me tell you what he said. Listen up. Yes, I'm willing, but th am I, this is the new guy, working with a new guy. Yeah, I'm willing, but am I to be consigned with a life? I don't know what page these things are on. Eh, who cares? <laughs> but am I consigned to a life where I shall be boring, stupid, and glum, like some righteous people I see? I know I got to get along without liquor, but how can I? Have you a sufficient substitute? Yes. There is a substitute, and it's vastly more than that. It is a fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. There, now he's writing a book. He could have said, he said the he could have said the substitute was God. He could have said the substitute is working with others. He could have said the substitute is praying or whatever. He could have said anything. He's writing a book. He says, he says, yeah. The, it's a fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous. There you will find release from care, boredom, and worry. That's what I needed. A release from my worry and my boredom. I was so boring, I was bored, Jason. Anyway, <laughs> your, your imagination will be fired. Life will mean something at last. The most satisfactory years of your existence lie ahead. Thus we find the fellowship. And so will you. So let me tell you folks something. You helped me. My joy, my, just like Bill Wilson, he wrote it and I've lived it. Frequent contact with newcomers and each other is the bright spot of our lives. He didn't say your right, bright spot of your life is meditation. He didn't say bright spot of your life is your, uh, you know, your job, your career, your family relationship. No, he said, he said, frequent contact with newcomers and each other. It's exactly what has happened for me. I love being with my people. It means everything to me. This is my language. You're my tribe. This is where I get reminded who I am. I need reminders of the plan for living. I can't read a book and then go practice it. I need constant reminders, constant experience of others telling me how to do it. These little slices of humanity at these AA meetings, these little one hour sessions, I've been inspired and motivated. I've gotten to see and hear exactly what works, how this girl is doing it and how that guy is doing it. And guess what? Go to meetings, you get to hear what doesn't work. 
you get to hear people full of rage and resentments and not willing to clean up their side of the street, and we get to see the hideousness of relapse. I get to see these little, in AA meetings, these little triumphs of the human spirit. I get to see, not, not some, how about 100% of the time I get to see mothers who lost their kids get those kids back. How often did I say? How often did he say? 100% of the time. You stay sober, maybe not the first week, Maybe not the first month. Show me a mother that's staying sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. They get those kids back, man. Happens every time. It's impossible to not become, it's impossible to not become an example of what's on offer here. And I see it all the time. I just saw it over there at the Puente House. A girl lost those kids. Now she's got nine months and she just went and spent the weekend with those kids. And I got lifetime, I've had a lifetime of those stories and I need those. I need those stories to keep my hope up, to keep my joy up. You know, not every meeting and not every member, but the big picture is there's joy and love and triumphs of the human spirit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's also the reminders of the ugliness of alcoholism. So I'm out of time. I'm going to tell you one story and I'm going to sit down, Jason. Just because I'm out of time doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Let me make that very clear. Does anybody care that that guy that had 40 years didn't know what step four was? Does anybody care? We don't judge that. Hell no. I get it. You were nervous. You know, the lights are absolute horrors up here. You know, I'm, I'm not really this bald, really. It's, just, it's the lights. Does this podium make me look fat? What's going on here? They're leaving in troves, Jason. What time? I got up here. I got 10 minutes. Go, good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Great speaker tonight, guaranteed. Uh, where was I? I'm going to jump up and race right through, and then I'm going to tell you a story that uh, everything I know about Alcoholics Anonymous is going to be in the last story. I'm going to tell it as fast as I can. But first, I'm going to tell you what happened to a big, dumb loser like me going to Alcoholics Anonymous, meeting my friends at Ohio Street. Monday night, here was my meeting schedule. I'd see my friends. Monday night, Kelton. I'd see, we, just like you folks are doing, you see your friends, hey, I'll see you at this meeting this night, I'll see you at this meeting that night. I'd go to Monday night, Kelton. Tuesday night, two plus two. Wednesday night, I'd sneak into the Pacific group. I didn't have a jacket. So uh, <laughs> Thursday night, Ohio Street, Young People's, The Gong Show. Friday night, big dumb loser like me, going to Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills going to the A&A meetings, and then I'd go Saturday night back at Ohio Street, then we'd all meet up with our friends and go to a sober dance. They had sober dances in Hollywood and Venice Beach and out in the valley. Anybody here ever been to the, a sober dance? All right, so you can tell the others, it's a whole new bottom that you hit in sobriety. Oh, man. Oh. You find yourself on some church basement on a Saturday night, <laughs> dancing to the 80s, a bunch of sober white people, man, oh God. A level of lame I never knew existed. <laughs> but I went to all of them, because that's where I honed my moves. And I still got them, people. Uh, I was five years sober, 23 years old, living at the armpit of the planet at that time, Hollywood, California, Hollywood, California in 1982, 23 years old, never had a thousand dollars in my life, came to California with 600, I drove a $125 enduro motorbike, that means dirt and street, and I rode it on the dirt and the street, and I didn't have a license. Uh, I was five years sober. I failed at every job. I, I worked at Sears in Santa Monica. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't pay my rent. I lived in a little efficiency apartment on Formosa at Fountain, which if anybody knows Hollywood, it was just, there were, yeah, it was nasty. So uh, there were, you know, sex worker women up on Sunset Boulevard, which was a block away, and a block away on Santa Monica Boulevard with Boys Town, and, and uh, I couldn't pay my rent. But I had two newcomers on my floor. 
Well, they, I was on the floor too, but I was in the bedroom because it was my place. They were in the, in the living room. And, uh, and uh, those guys told me about a job. Uh, the, one of those guys, he's sober 41 years now, I guess it is, 40 years. And uh, he, he made it, Roy Tate, 41 years sober. Those guys told me about a sales job. This is why I tell you about how AA, everything I got and every good thing I know in this life, I got it from rooms like this and people like you. This guy was, a, these were new guys, but they knew about a guy out in the valley. They said, Jimmy, there's a guy out in the valley that does the hiring for this big sales company, this big tool company. I said, tool? I can't even screw in a light bulb. They said, dude, it's, a, it, it's straight commission. I said, I'm straight commission. I, I, I'm going I, to fail. They said, no, 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 listen. They pay $200 a week training for the first two weeks. And I said, wait. Is that four hundred dollars? And I told him, I said, "Dudes, I'm at the jumping off place. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can't do. It. I'll never get hired. I'll never." I told him, I said, I, "I think I'm just going to put on a dress and walk down to Santa Monica Boulevard." <laughs> and that, first of all, don't judge. That's not my thing. Okay? I mean, it, I, it's not my thing. But twenty dollars is twenty dollars, and. Uh, <laughs> I ended up, I didn't do that. Unlike Wayne, apparently did it for years, apparently. Um, or was, yeah, okay, sorry, Wayne. Uh, I don't, I don't want to break your anonymity. Uh, they hired me. The guy hired me. He, says, he said, you got five years? I said, yeah, I got five years. He says, you're sober five years? I said, yeah. I was chain smoking, bouncing off the walls. They hired me. I was salesman of the year. There was, a guy, there was 120 salesmen. Some of them had been there 20 years. And I outsold them all. I had a technique. I know it's a stretch, but listen, I had a technique. <laughs> I wore people out. <laughs> Just like I'm doing here Saturday morning in uh, Seaside, Oregon. Five years sober, never had a thousand dollars in my life. Six and a half years sober, salesman of the year, big trophy, saved every nickel I made, worked like a dog, bought a house in Studio City, California for $105,000, sold it a couple, couple, few years later, 605, bought a house in Malibu, California over 30 years ago now. And uh, I tell you that not to say, hey, look at me. I tell you that because those AA guys were right. You stick around here, you don't know what's on offer. I found something I was good at. And I quit that company because I'm not a good employee. And because uh, I want to do my own thing. And I started my own company, Rock Bottom Imports. And I sold rock and roll stickers and pins and posters. I left that tool company. And you know what's so funny? I've got the little house out in Malibu. The company I left turned into Harbor Freight. <laughs> Harbor Freight. <laughs> And they wanted me to be a manager. Eric Schmidt, I swear to God, go Google him. Eric Schmidt, owner of Harbor Freight, he wanted me to be a sales manager. I said, nah, I'm quitting. <laughs> He's worth $5 billion. He's worth $5 billion. So career advice, come and see me after the meeting. I make, <laughs> I make really good moves, people. I wanted to sell stickers. Swear to God, I got a little starter house in Malibu, a little thing up on the bluff. I have to look at Eric Schmidt's house right in front of me on the broad beach. I had a nice, I've had an amazing life. Two minutes left, I'm going to tell you a five minute story. <laughs> I wasn't kidding. Just, hey, anybody got to go, go. I'm finishing this damn story. Listen, I don't fit in in Malibu, California. I don't surf. I'm from Pennsylvania. I can barely swim. And, uh, but I had other brothers and sisters there. I ended up, I was in importing, exporting, selling stuff. I had a thousand. I hired all my AA buddies. We were selling. We went to trade shows. I had a thousand stores used to buy product from me. And, and I was, I had a buddy that was going to Asia. He says, Jimmy, I'm going to China. 
I said, dude, I'll go with you because I was buying product. I went to overseas with this AA guy. We went everywhere, China, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia. And I ended up on the island of Bali over, what is it, 25 years ago. No, 30, 30 years ago, 30 years ago. I ended up on the island of, of Indonesia and uh, man, I loved it. I was buying all this product. I took on a partner. I leased out my house in Malibu and I stayed there. I lived, in, I lived in, uh, on the island of Bali from 1994 to 2011. And uh, I don't have what it takes to live overseas. I didn't know the language then, I know it now. And, uh, but I found other brothers and sisters. I found AA over there. There was a couple little meetings over there. And uh, I loved it, I stayed there. I stayed there because I met a girl there. And I'm married to that girl. I just, we celebrated two weeks ago, 23 years of marriage. And uh, <laughs> we got two kids. I got two mongrel, uh, mongrel kids that were born over there. And, uh, they grew up in a sober, drug-free home. How do you put a price tag on that, man? A lot different than I grew up, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you folks. I stayed in Bali, and I stayed in Bali because there was AA. There was a couple little meetings on the beach. And there was a meeting behind a church. Sometimes they let us in the back of a church. There was meetings in restaurants. I said, dudes, I'm staying here because I saw all these tourists coming through, all these Australians coming through Bali, and there was a vibrancy to the AA community. Plus, I was crazy about this girl. and. Uh, um, I, I, I said, guys, I'm staying here. I leased out my house in Malibu, and I stayed there, and I opened up a meeting hall. It's still there today. And uh, I started a convention, had Carl and Mickey Bush and Clancy all came to the convention because we'd have 400 people from 40 different countries. And uh, I'm going to tell you this story. I'm going to sit down. So I, uh, I'm telling it. That, so listen, it's, it, yeah. All right. So. I went to this meeting every morning, every morning, every morning. I started the meeting and I, and I had a business life. I ended up, I was in, had a nice business over there. And, uh, but my life was all about my frequent contact with newcomers and each other. And my life starts after the 9 a.m. AA meeting every morning. And I welcome visitors from around the world. And uh, it's a valuable resource for people when they travel to have an AA meeting to go to. And, uh, I, we met people from every part of the globe. And one time, one day I was in there and there was a guy named Surfer Dave, Big Wave Dave. And he was one of these larger than life AA members that we, if you're lucky enough to get to meet, this guy lit up the AA room. He was full of love and joy, he had family. He was there with his 15 year old daughter and they were surfing. Her name was Chloe, they called her Cloney because she surfed just like her dad, Big Wave Dave from Sydney, Australia. And uh, man, he lit up the room. And I remember, I, maybe some of you folks have experienced that. You ever leave a meeting? I remember leaving the meeting and I thought, God, I'm so lucky to be in this AA. I'm so lucky to be filled with this joy. Where else would I meet a guy that's just a solid, loving guy that makes you laugh and cry and feel good about yourself and I feel good about my life? You know, an AA solid guy. And then we had that Bali bomb 21 years ago. You can Google it, the Bali bomb, that Al Qaeda came over there and they blew up our little village, our little nightclub restaurant row. And they killed 200, thousands of people blown up, killed 202 Australians. And uh, it was hideous and awful. And uh, you know, what do you do when they blow up your town? What do you do? You know, I'll tell you what you do. Same thing I've done at the, after the LA riots. Same thing we do at 9-11. Same thing I've done after the Malibu fires. I go to AA, I go to AA, because this we're talking about, we're not talking about drinking and you know drugs every day, we're talking about living, we're talking about how to live through this. I need support, I need treatment, I need treatment, because I freak out when life happens, I need treatment. So I go to my AA meetings, and you know what, I walked into that AA meeting that morning, and there was Surfer Dave, and he looked like a zombie. He was, it was the grossest thing I ever saw. He was destroyed and he was spit out that his 15 year old daughter did not come home. He lost that girl in that Bali bomb. And you know, I don't tell you this hideous story to remind you how unfair and tragic life is. I'm not telling it for that reason. I'm telling it because for members of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not the end of the story. 
Listen, this guy, had he had fought three other kids to raise. There was no body to claim. We helped him get his passport and, and go back home. He had to go home. And, you know, it was gross and horrible. And, but, you know, life goes on. I learned in my life that life goes on. And, and I just kept going to my meeting every, every morning. And the island came back. You know, uh, it came back. People started coming back. Carts started coming back. And, you know, today sometimes I'm afraid to miss a meeting because you never know what you're going to see and hear at an AA meeting. It's not always the same. Not always the same people saying the same thing, hopefully. You know, I got to, I walked in one morning. I didn't know. And there he was. There he was, Surfer Dave, and he was back. It was so clear. His eyes were big, and his face was full of joy. And thank God I didn't miss that morning. He started talking to us. He says, yeah, I'm here. It's a two-year memorial of losing my daughter. And he got a chance to share with us. And he said, you know, my whole family, my extended family, all the neighbors, they say, Dave, you're the rock, Dave. You're a rock. You're the rock that kept this family together, Dave. And he just turned to us and he says, you know, these people will never understand. They'll never understand. I'm not the rock. I'm not the rock. He said, you people are the rock. Alcoholics Anonymous is the rock. He talked about how his home group loved him back to health and love and dignity. I saw a guy get through the most hideous event in the human experience. Nobody's had it worse than a guy like Surfer Dave. Nobody's had, no, there's nothing worse. And uh, I saw him get through it and he gave all credit to his membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. So are we just talking about drugs and alcoholism? No, man. We're talking about love and supporting each other through everything. And I learned, that day changed me. I was 21 years ago. I learned I'm never going to whine about my little problems with traffic and my shithead kids. I'm never going <laughs> to, I'm never going to complain in the meeting about it, ever. Sorry for cursing. These New Jersey people are really uptight. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't, because we stay sober, we got love, we got support, we can get through anything. I wouldn't give up my seat in AA for anyone or anything. Every good thing I've ever known in this life is because of you people. Thank you so much for putting up with me. The longest talk in AA history, ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a hand. <laughs>